Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone from wherever in the world you may be joining us. My name is Sarah. I am the coordinator for YEmerge. I would like to officially open the ninth session of our Emerging and Systematic Risk monthly lectures with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many indigenous nations have a long side um, relationship with the territory upon which our campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Tokorano and has been caretaken by Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Medis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holder, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon, Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event and our participants may be joining from various locations, I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderator, our speaker, and our participants from around the world. Welcome to our webinar. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, so without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Carly Rosens. Dr. Rosens is a mathematical biologist and math educator. As a mathematical biologist, they use modeling to study the spread, containment, and evolution of infectious diseases. After completing their Master of Science, Dr. Rosens worked for the Canadian Consortium for Pandemic Preparedness Modeling, where they studied the cause of the second wave of the H1N1 swine flu pandemic. During their PhD, their focus turned to agriculture, studying how industrial farming might cause poultry disease to evolve to become more deadly. After their PhD, Dr. Rosens joined the University of California, Berkeley, as a postdoctoral fellow, where they researched the ongoing threat of bovine tuberculosis in the UK and how recent changes to beekeeping might be killing honeybees. Currently, Dr. Rosens' research focuses on using modeling to study the health and sustainability of the poultry industry. Dr. Rosens, thank you very much for moderating today, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, likely int introduction. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome our speaker today, Maggie Watson. She's the operations lead from the Featherboard Command Center. And uh, I personally find poultry diseases very interesting, obviously, that poultry uh, are very numerous, very important, and they present, it being a managed system, present really interesting ecological and evolutionary um, issues. Uh, so I'm very excited to see what Maggie and the FBCC have planned in terms of preparedness and prevention. So just as a quick reminder, if you have any questions, please keep them to the end of the talk, and then you can either raise your hand and I'll call on you, or you can uh, type your question into the chat, and I will uh, read your question for you. All right, you can take it from here, Maggie. Okay, thank you. Share my screen here. Okay. All right. Yes, so today um, I'll be talking to everybody uh, about uh, what Ontario's poultry industry um, is doing to be prepared um, and prevent and respond to um, infectious diseases um, in the uh, province. So um, I'll start off to I like to give a little acknowledgement that I'm very lucky uh, to work with lots of very capable and very knowledgeable experts like our moderator, um, epidemiologists, veterinarians. Uh, but I am, I myself, I'm a little more um, applied. I come solely from the uh, emergency management knowledge. Um, so if you have any questions that are more um, uh, scientific in nature, I'm happy to uh, answer them for you over email and get them to our uh, uh, executive director who is a veterinarian. So um, contact information at the end there. Okay, uh, so the Featherboard Command Center, FBCC, uh, what is it? People often ask me, oh my goodness, is that even a real thing? It's such a crazy name. Um, so the Featherboard Command Center um, is a, a collaborative effort between Ontario's four uh, poultry marketing boards. Um, so just a quick review, um, you heard Dr. Rosen mention um, the supply management system. 
So what is the supply management system? It is a system that is designed to create um, economic stability for the farmers and uh, the people that are demanding or consuming the product um, in agriculture. Um, so it brings about uh, the quota system and then the marketing boards that are uh, managing it. So in Ontario, uh, we have the chicken farmers of Ontario, the egg farmers, Ontario broiler hatching um, egg chick commission, um, and then the turkey farmers of Ontario. So the Feather Board Command Center is uh, an amalgamation or a joint endeavor of all of those to focus on infectious diseases that affect um, and the industry wants to ensure we're preventing, um, prepared for, and ready to respond to, along with um, the government who is the lead agency on various diseases. So when we talk about infectious disease, what, what are the hazards? Um, so there are many. <laughs> it's the wall of text that I'll hit you with here. So we zoom out and we think about um, beyond the poultry industry, what, what are the hazards uh, for farmed animal disease in general? So what you see on the screen here <clears throat> are there's federally reportable diseases, um, and those are reportable to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And then we have um, Ontario provincially notifiable hazards, and those go to OMAFRA. Um, or the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Nice long one. Um, so what a federally reportable disease is, is that it's a disease that um, a member of the public, the owner of the flock or the herd, the veterinarian um, are required, if they know or they detect it, are required to make that agency aware. Um, and similar goes for uh, provincially notifiable hazards the flock owner, herd owner, veterinarian, the lab that detects it, um, depending on um, the disease virus we're talking about, uh, they must make um, the, the respective agency we're talking about here aware. Um, so you'll see there's many on the screen. Uh, and the, four, the ones that I've highlighted in red are the ones that are particularly relevant to what we're doing here. Um, at FBCC, those are the ones that are relevant to uh, poultry or avian um, species. So then who are the responders um, when we're talking about farmed animal disease or in the poultry industry specifically? So you have the government, that they are the lead agency. Um, so federal, provincial, and territorial. So of course the Canadian Food Inspection C will be, uh, inspection agency, sorry, will be uh, on federally reportable diseases. Um, and then the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, they will be uh, the lead for immediately notifiable diseases. Um, and then they work very closely, both of those agencies. Um, and the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Affairs, or MAFRA, which you'll hear me say a lot, um, they aren't, they're certainly involved even when there's a, a federally reportable disease. So already you'll see we have two levels of government involved. So it becomes um, lots of convolution already. Um, they're very helpful and it's very important, but it's already getting a little bit difficult. We have two levels of government. Um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Health Canada, of course, we're talking about infectious disease. Um, Environment and Climate Change Canada, so they become involved because there's all kinds of wild birds now. Um, Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, that's Ontario. Um, municipalities and local governments. Um, and then we have the local public health units. So lots going on. And then on the industry side, we have their marketing boards. So of course, we're talking about a supply managed system. So we have the marketing boards that are involved. Um, and then the poultry service support sector. Um, so the farms, and then we have all of the other um, businesses and organizations that are going on around the farms um, that help get the products uh, to the grocery store. So they're involved. Um, and then agribusiness, so feed, um, co-ops, they are involved as well. And then of course, the big important one, the heart of the industry, which is farmers. So um, the disruption can be very large to the farmers. So what's FBCC's part in this? There's so many people and responders going on. Why are we here? FBCC is here to integrate the industry side into that government side. So you can imagine in Ontario, if there's four different poultry marketing boards and they share a goal uh, when there is a hazard going on, 
um, if their goal is very similar when we have a hazard or a risk or something coming towards us in an infectious disease, uh, the federally reportable diseases um, that are managed by the lead agency, which is the government, the Feather Board Command Center's job is to integrate that response together and help everything become more clear between those four agencies and the government's response. Let me just move my, there we go. <clears throat> so in short, it is an industry-led endeavor to target diseases to carry out the four stages of the emergency management cycle. Um, so if we go back in history, which we'll look at a timeline next, it'd become evident um, that we're talking about maybe 20, 20 years ago, um, that the government alone um, maybe didn't have the resources or shouldn't have to maybe have the resources to adequately respond to every single serious disease outbreak unilaterally. Um, and if the industry was set up to help integrate and fully respond, then we could have a more fulsome um, response. Okay, so going through our timeline, our formation here. So about 2003, um, that was when we had first had the first, first informal um, collaboration before between the four um, marketing boards. And in and around the same time there, what we're looking at was the um, Army. So the Agricultural Response Materials Management Inc. That's a mouthful. Um, so what that was, was it, that was established with the government, um, so with government support, I should say, um, to provide uh, for timely delivery of biosecurity kits and biocontainment tools, which we'll talk about what biosecurity is a little bit later. Um, to help farmers delivering those to farmers um, to help them contain disease in an emergency. Um, and then flash forward a little bit to 2010. Um, so we have the first joint Ontario poultry industry, OMAFRA and animal health lab disease outbreak simulation. So you're starting to see already um, in the formation and development, the collaboration between the industry, OMAFRA and then the animal health lab. Um, so Animal Health Lab in Ontario, very key partner in detecting um, disease quickly um, and the industry being integrated with OMAFRA and the Animal Health Lab, uh, very key in doing things rapidly. Uh, 2011, so that's when the Feather Board Command Centre really comes into existence and the first joint emergency management strategy that's across all four boards where they're sharing the same strategy. Um, rather than having four separate ones, um, is formed. So before that, when there's an infectious disease, all four of those marketing boards, which represents all four um, different poultry farmers, so different species or producing a different poultry, poultry product, they would be doing something very similar each time um, there was a disease outbreak, uh, but they were working towards the same goal, just working in silos. So now in 2011, we see they're all working together on the same strategy and trying to pool and share their resources to do it better, faster, uh, quicker. Okay, uh, 2013 and 2017, um, they get to try out their strategy with doing um, a multi-agency disease outbreak simulation. Um, and then the government was also involved in this, so at both levels. Uh, 2015 and 2016, they're actually being tested. Um, so we're not talking about a simulation here. We have actual AI outbreaks uh, in Ontario. Um, so it validated the strategy. Um, another simulation in 2017 and then 22, 2022, 2023. So today um, we have ongoing um, highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreaks, which is testing the coordination up to today. Um, of the Feather Board Command Center. Um, and then I say the resilience as well, because today the highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreaks are um, broader than we've seen in the past. So we're testing how resilient that strategy really is. So um, now I'm thinking for the rest of the presentation, we can go through and talk about um, how 
we go through the different stages of the emergency management cycle to achieve this goal. Um, so what are the different angles we look at? So when we talk about the industry and the response, we have government, industry, the farmers, but within that industry side, um, there's many different lenses. Uh, so what are the different lenses looking at in terms of the stages of the emergency management cycle? Okay, so for preparedness, what are some industry initiatives we do for preparedness? So training uh, and exercises help us to get to that, that stage of integration. You've heard me say integration many times at this point. Um, so we use the incident management system in Ontario. So um, to integrate with a mapper specifically, and then the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is using um, the incident command system at a federal level. So we have all of the staff from the feather boards that we're lucky to work with. Um, the feather boards are the marketing boards, I should say. Um, we train them um, in incident management system uh, beforehand. And then we also have specific training. So you see me, I write mapping and uh, JS training here, um, but other staff that are doing other specific roles within the response. So let's say uh, media training or uh, case officers for the specific um, premises that are experiencing a disease outbreak, um, they do their training beforehand. Um, and then exercises. So that's doing exercises across all of those different agencies that are trying to work together um, in a tight and stressful time, um, doing those beforehand. And then of course, um, the specific simulations in the specific areas. And those will help us to get to that integrated part. Prevention. So this one's more from a, on an on-farm uh, perspective. Um, so from the farmer's point of view, uh, but everyone is, is helping to work uh, in this area as well. So you can think about the staff from the boards and the, the poultry service support sector as well, definitely um, is helpful in this area. Uh, but biosecurity. So what is biosecurity for those who may not know? Um, they are tangible or intangible security measures and steps that are taken to prevent the introduction of pathogens, toxins, any type of hazard um, that may introduce the spread of an infection into a protected population of animals. Um, so you can think about if you've ever visited somewhere where the health of, of animals was at on the mind, um, you may have been asked to change your shoes or, or wipe your shoes. Um, and the idea there is to remove anything that may be carrying um, disease into the area. Um, so these are biosecurity standards, um, and they're the key to prevention and limitation of disease spread. Um, so those are the key. Um, the marketing boards require, as part of prevention, um, that the quota holding farmers, part of the supply management system, they require those quota holding farmers to maintain strict biosecurity standards on their farm. Um, and those programs, those biosecurity programs, are included in annual inspection programs. So that's kind of a, those biosecurity standards are an all, all the time run of the mill kind of idea. Um, and then we also have heightened biosecurity protocol. Um, and that's something that is enacted when there is suspicion or a confirmed case of poultry disease um, in the province as a whole, or um, we can also do it in a specific um, area. Okay, so another um, part of response is talking about how our integration works. So you hear me talk about um, training of, of IMS. So this is our, this is our general um, FBCC IMS structure. Um, another reason we love IMS in this type of area is that it's very scalable and modular. Um, so if you remember looking back at that, that screen of um, potential diseases, we can see there's many different types of um, different incursions of disease that can require different levels of response. So to give you an example, if we have infectious laryntracheitis, that's better than I thought it was going to go. <laughs> pronouncing that, um, it may not require that we carry out this whole um, 
fill this and staff this whole structure. If it's a smaller case in a, a secluded area, um, we have a emergency response plan that we share with OMAFRA and the Ontario Animal Health Network. Um, so that's something that we are able to carry out pretty routinely. We may not have to staff this whole plan. Um, so we're able to only roll out the sections we need. Pretty basic um, incident management uh, system practice. However, if we have something that's a, a little bit more complex, uh, such as the highly pathogenic avian influenza response, then we may carry out all of these um, roles and responsibilities in here. Uh, so let me talk about that one. So here, as we see, so highly pathogenic avian influenza in 2022 and 2023, Definitely something I would put in the more of a complex response um, category. Uh, so we had 39 staff from all four of the feather boards um, that were responding at pretty much all times uh, from the March of 2022. Uh, there were some waves. So the waves are due to the migratory uh, bird pattern, excuse me, um, and flyways. So there were some breaks. Um, but the 39th staff were really experiencing a, an ongoing uh, rotation there. Um, so the staff were working in a virtual emergency operations center. Um, we were doing it, the integration with CFI and OMAF for using the, the virtual um, emergency operations center. There were some staff that when they needed to work in person, um, the case officers, for example, um, or the uh, permitting staff that need to be right there. Um, they would do that part, but for the most part, it was virtual. We have mapping and alerting of control zones. So we'll talk more about control zones shortly. Um, and the mapping and alerting um, is really a key part. Um, and we do that alerting bit through our communication. So there was 146 highly pathogenic um, avian influenza related communications that were issued since March 2022. Um, not all were related to alerts. Some were related to troubleshooting and support for the farmers and the industry. Um, and the reason that we have to do um, some troubleshooting and support is because a lot of these um, communications that have to be issued are very technical information, directions, those kinds of things. Um, and we'll see here. So when we talk about control zones, um, part of, in the case of highly pathogenic avian influenza, part of the CFIA's responsibility in carrying out their mandate to limit the spread of disease uh, is to control the spread of the disease. And part of what they'll do there to, do, to limit it is issuing control zones that are about a, a 10 kilometer area. Um, and to do so, they will ask that, or order, I should say, that um, all of the poultry, poultry byproduct, um, birds, things that have been in contact with poultry, they do not move um, in, out, within um, the zone unless they have been issued a permit. So this is what it looks like, is what I'm showing you here on the screen. Uh, it's very similar to uh, if you've ever filled out like a, a passport renewal form or maybe been through a, an international uh, port of entry and you filled out the, the declaration form. So not a super compl complex form, but it must be filled out correctly uh, or it will be rejected. So you can imagine if the farmers are used to going about their business and following the, the normal uh, food safety processes and uh, procedures, lots of paperwork there, but they're used to it. And then overnight, there is a new infected premise um, and they must fill out this paperwork in order to get stuff moving. Um, it requires a lot of extra support. Um, so that's where a lot of the time and effort from the staff um, in the industry go is to making sure there's support there uh, in order to get everything flowing. Okay, um, and then another response area that I think is especially key, and this is one of my, in my personal opinion, I think um, as 
farmers start to use or continue to use technology a lot more um, in informing their their bird health decisions in and out of the barn, um, this one will become uh, very or continue to become very important. Um, so this is our alerting uh, tool. So what we do here is when we are made aware by CFI or MAFRA of a new premise, um, we draw a 10 kilometer area while trying to maintain the, the privacy of um, the infected premise. So we'll draw a 10 kilometer biosecurity advisory area. Um, and then we'll try to quickly and urgently, um, as most quickly as possible, um, alert all of the farmers and those who have self-subscribed self themselves, excuse me, um, to in the area to that um, biosecurity area. So you'll see kind of what the beginning of one looks like on the screen there, uh, and then the biosecurity area as well. So why this is important um, and a important uh, response measure is because when you're talking about infectious disease, just like we were talking about in, in the biosecurity area, the limiting the spread is very key. So when we make the farmers, the service industry that's moving, has trucks moving, aware that here's an area we need to be um, cautious of, um, it helps everyone make more informed decisions uh, about what they are doing. So sometimes um, the CFIA will also limit their, make their control zones known. I should say in the case of, of highly pathogenic avian influenza, they make their control zones. We were talking about with those permits there. Um, they're not able to do that as quickly because they, they draw those zones very thoughtfully and they, they put them up with their permit requirements. Um, so we're able to, to draw these biosecurity advisory areas, uh, which are, um, issued to the farmers and, and service industry for making decisions, we're able to do that uh, quicker um, and, and get them out a little faster than um, the lead agencies are issuing the control zones um, for permits. Yeah. Okay, so, so those are some of the um, things that we are up to in the industry um, to keep everyone uh, kind of coordinated and, and safe and thinking about infectious disease on, on top of mind there. Uh, so I hope that was uh, informative. And as I said, I am happy to answer any questions that, that I can about our emergency, emergency management, but I also am happy to point you to our, our incident commander who also loves to chat about um, animal disease and farmed animal disease and is also a veterinarian. So he has a little bit broader scope of knowledge than, than I do too. Thanks so much, Maggie. That was really interesting. Um, I know I have like an hour's worth of questions, I think. Uh, Go for it. <laughs> also, just keep an eye on the chat as well to see if I get any. Um, so you mentioned that uh, there's quota holding farms. Yes. And it sounds like the quota holding farms are under stricter regulation than non quota holding farms. I was wondering um, just a little bit about those two different entities in general. Like, are there a lot of farms that aren't quota uh, holding? And do you see more outbreaks on these farms because maybe they aren't under such strict biosecurity measures? And then if there is an outbreak on a quota holding farm versus a non quota holding farm, do you think the procedure is similar? Like would their uh, tests go to the same facility? I'm just wondering like, what, what is life like on those two different? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, just, to, just to answer your, so I'll answer your first question off the top of my head. So uh, to my knowledge, all of the, all of the tests do go um, ultimately to the same um, labs. So um, they're all under the same, um, seeing CFI requirements go to the same lab, especially when they're uh, under the suspicion of being um, HPAI um, at that point. Um, so as far as there being more um, quota holding farms versus non um, quota holding farms, I can't remember, I, I'm very familiar with um, the Ontario numbers for the last few years. Um, outside of Ontario, I think it just happened to be a little bit 
different. But I think so we did see that there were many, um, we call them small flocks too. Um, so I think we did see there were many um, small flocks that also experienced um, being infected premises. Um, so the difference would be, I think that as you identified, the, the quota holding farms have these biosecurity requirements that they must follow as part of being a quota holding farm. And then when or if they do experience being an infected premise, they have their marketing boards to support them in whatever requirements the CFIA, if it's highly pathogenic avian influenza, um, is asking them to carry out the policies and procedures the CFIA asked them to carry out. Their marketing board or the FBCC is there to support them in completing whatever is part of the policy and procedure. Um, the, the small flocks or the non quota holding farms um, may be an individual that has owns some birds or they chose to, to, to own some birds. And if they, they don't have um, a, a marketing board um, rep or someone behind them, um, they may not have as much support in, in carrying out the, um, what is required in, of them after becoming an effective premise. So I think um, that's some of the that's challenge. really interesting because I could imagine there would be like a small backyard flock outbreak and then there would be this 10 radius uh, drawn 10 kilometer radius drawn around them that encompasses these like commercial operations that mm -hmm. then have to see some like serious um, scaling down of production. But I guess that's where the feather boards come in and, and would they financially support these companies if it, if like eggs are being thrown out or um, it's the, so the feather board command center and, and the marketing board. So the feather board command center's mandate is to support, um, the quota holding, uh, farmers and the, and the marketing boards. Um, but it is, as you identify, it's the small flock, um, holders and the people that own, uh, backyard flocks are a part of the landscape, um, and mm -hmm. infectious disease and, and good emergency planning. Um, to be aware of them in Ontario. So um, that is part of it is part of the landscape. And I think that is something that, um, you know, OMAFRA, the government and everyone who is part of the, the planning process has become increasingly, I think, aware and doing a much better job, I would say, of being prepared to assist those um, individuals and those types of operations when they do become infected. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, we have a, a, a question here by Ali. How do you coordinate if there is a cross-boundary emergency? So if mm -hmm. it goes between Canada, US, can uh, Ontario, Quebec, something like that. Yeah, so so interesting. So um, Canada, US, so that is, there's lots of trade um, questions that come into it whenever it's like cross uh, borders. So it, it certainly is across borders because there's lots of spread through uh, migratory birds and the, the migratory birds don't care what the border is. <laughs> um, so there's there's those things. The the US has um very interesting um emergency management through the like the USDA and and those kinds of organizations. Um, now you the Ontario Quebec. So Quebec has a very um they have a similar organization uh, with a, a cool acronym as well. Uh, so <laughs> they we work with them and uh, some of our structure is modeled after them um, as well. So similarly, if we have a case that is right um, on the border and there's actually a border of Ontario and Quebec, I should specify, and there's actually a lot of poultry density and poultry production um, kind of east of Ottawa up there, um, then yes, we would we would try to coordinate with that um, agency in Quebec that does the similar um, actions to us there. Um, and often when we send out an alert um, that's close to that area, they will re-broadcast uh, it to their service industry that's that's up there um, in, in that area of Quebec because they will have um, some service industry that doesn't discriminate on, on the border of the two provinces. Okay, that's great. Uh, a few more questions here from Abad. Uh, 
Thank you for a great presentation. Could you please explain a little more about the mapping and simulation part in training and exercise, how these mm -hmm. kinds of tools being used in uh, the prevention phase? And is there any specific experience in this area to be mentioned? I, I, I'm a modeler myself. And so I, when I saw the simulations, I was like, ooh, yes, what are those yeah. looking like? Can yeah. I see them? Yeah. <laughs> That's I, and I think that's something that's that's particularly interest to me uh, as a student too. Um, that drew me to this uh, organization, and it's somewhere we can grow as well. Um, so I think the the most recent um, simulation we did was uh, we had some farms that it, that agreed to participate, um, and they had um, some GPS. Um, trying to make sure I'm getting the right words here. They had some GPS technology on their farm. And then we had service industry. So we're talking about like feed trucks and delivery trucks that agreed to participate. Um, and they had to, they tracked their movement um, around and they used geofencing um, on the farm. That's what I thought was the word I was looking for, excuse me, <laughs> on their farm. Um, so the farms agreed to be geofenced. Um, and then the service industry uh, vehicles that would be moving on and off the farm had GPS trackers in their vehicle. Um, and then they tracked uh, their movement uh, for a few months, I believe, actually. Um, and then they simulated a disease outbreak. And then they pulled up back up that data that they had tracked for uh, a few months to see if they could use that data in a simulated um, outbreak to make more informed decisions um, at that point of simulating an outbreak to inform people who had been on that farm that oh, we now know this farm had, uh, you know, you name the disease um, and, and you've been in contact with it and you, service vehicle, have been in contact with X, Y, Z um, rather than using the, um, you know, radius approach or something else. So, yeah, it's that's more of a, a tracing approach, if you will. Okay. Um, that's really interesting. Uh, so in terms of the things that you're tracking there, uh, it's individuals as well as uh, industry vehicles? Yeah. So so it would be, if that one was industry uh, vehicles. Um, and then the, I should say the farmers were, were who agreed to it. So that was their, when I say they, I mean their farm was the mm -hmm. geofenced. And then it was the, the vehicle as well, because the vehicle is what presents um, lots of the risk if it's driving onto uh, the farm. Would you, uh, does, uh, in terms of the farmers, do you have access to their, their movement as well? Is that what geofence means? And not now, no, in, in that, in that in this, uh, in the simulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In that simulation, the farmers who agreed to that, mm -hmm. um, I believe, yeah, I believe that they had, if I'm remembering correctly, I believe that they also put, um, trackers in their uh one of them at least had had one in their vehicle uh for the interest of the the experiment mm -hmm. um because if you think uh if you live in a farming uh community um sometimes that is that is a part of of biosecurity you have multiple farmers um, that are going down uh to a coffee shop to meet they all have barns and now they're they're cross um you know mingling if you will <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. so that is, that was part of the experiment was having anyone who may be going on and off the farm, um, having a tracker and the geofence to answer your question is a perimeter, uh, um, like a digital perimeter around, um, their, their property. So, uh, just, uh, I don't want to hog all the questions, but yeah. just one, <laughs> one follow up. I'm curious, uh, can you think of a specific case where you know how an infectious agent made it onto the farm? Um, no, like, no, I don't. And that's not, to be honest with you, that's not something often we as an agency are, are told. Um, that's something that, you know, the, the farmer may speculate, um, or I would suspect that the, the lead agency may, the government agency may discuss with them. Um, mm -hmm. But that's not something um, that particularly we may concern ourselves with either in the response phase, um, because we're worried about, um, or we're concerned with um, alerting everybody else around. Mm -hmm. um, I think that generally like the, the common knowledge when we're trying to educate is things like if you're taking your ATV out on a, on a trail, for example, then let's not ride it back into the barn or, or something mm -hmm. like that. But 
that's something that might I would say generally a lot of the the farmers are very um, educated on um, at this point. All right, I'll, I'll stop hogging the questions. I'll <laughs> ask a few more. This is Michelle. Um, are farmers that sell eggs at their farm versus those that sell their eggs at a grocery store chain monitored as well? Do they report infectious disease in the poultry as well? Yeah, so so we the Canadian Food Inspection Agency um, uses the definitions, um, and I, sh I should not be answering for them, I suppose, but um, just from my knowledge. So the Canadian Food Inspection Agency uses we actually have a world um, organization of animal health um, and they will use, uh, especially in this outbreak, they'll use the definition of what is poultry or non-poultry. Um, they'll use that definition from the, the world organizational um, of animal health. And let me just make sure I'm giving the best information here. Um, so what is poultry or non-poultry and commercial or not commercial? Um, if that definition is taken uh, from them. So I believe if the question was uh, whether the place they're selling it, um, that doesn't always matter. It more can matter um, kind of like whether the, the product's being fully consumed um, within the home of the person who uh, like created it or farmed it, um, or it's being um, spread further than, than that premises. <laughs> Um, there's a, a bit of a comment from Rose Line who wants to thank you for your talk and then uh, is interested in, in collaborating, um, yeah. modeling with you. So if you look through the Q&A, you see uh, their information there. Um, I mean, I don't want to hold everybody up, but I you might not surprise you, but I have more questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned that some outbreaks... I think you mentioned that there was some detection of outbreaks in um, wildlife birds. Is that mm -hmm. true? Um, I just think like, uh, yeah, how, how does that, who reports those? And um, yeah, yes. has there ever been any, uh, you might not know this, but um, you know, there is a hunting season where people mm -hmm. are catching waterfowl. It seems like a great opportunity for hunters to report infectious birds or samples or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So and I think I, I may have failed to uh, mention it properly. But so we, I mentioned all of those, um, the organizations that are involved. Um, I brought up um, Environment and Climate Change Canada. So they're involved because um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So they are, their scope is um, farmed um, and domesticated animals, but um, or farmed animals, I should say more specifically. Um, so the Environment and Climate Change Canada, they look after um, wild birds, if you will. So let's say someone finds um, a, a wild bird that they look like, oh, it, it looks like it may be um, um, dead. They report that to the Canadian Wildlife Health, and I forget their acronym every time, <laughs> the Canadian Wildlife Health. Uh, I want to say cooperative. That's so not as good as I don't remember it. But yeah, so there's a specific agency that, that you can um, report it to. Um, and they are tracking wildlife um, and wild bird um, positives of, of avian influenza specifically. Um, and then they will do other um, diseases if there's another outbreak. Um, so there's different organizations that try to cover um, a lot of different um, areas. And then there was um, an interest at one point of what was going on um, in the Toronto Zoo, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that that was just in in what was going on there that doesn't mean um uh, sorry what am I trying to say there's there, that doesn't fall inside of the scope of maybe the CFI or something like that um so there's lots of different um type of birds that fall into the same definitions that I was talking about earlier um so yeah wild birds um fall under that um Canadian uh wildlife um organization Okay, I just saw that Ali had another question, or no, uh, Francesco had a question that was very similar to that. Is there yes. a consistent monitoring of wild bird populations? So I guess you you explained how if someone came upon a dead bird, how it would get reported and stored. Mm -hmm. Is there an agency that's out there maybe sampling or, or doing something more consistently than that? That's Environment and Climate Change um, Canada. Yeah, so they are out there checking on what everything, what's going on. Um, and there, they will come um, to those um, 
oh my goodness, <laughs> those uh, emergency operations centers and let everybody know, like, this is what we're seeing with, um, you know, wild birds uh, in terms of this area, or, you know, it's worse than it was last year or better than it was last year, which is what we got to see this year, which was good news. Mm -hmm. um, so that's Environment and Climate Change Canada. And then it is the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. I'm second guessing myself. Um, that's who the public would report to uh, if they found um, a dead bird um, in, in public. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it seems like you have access to all this amazing information, like yeah. simulations, <laughs> the data, the GPS data that went into them, these confirmed cases in specific locations. Is this data publicly available or how would someone mm -hmm. like myself uh, use this data to inform their models? Yeah, so there was, um, there still is, the, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, um, they have a, uh, for AI specifically, or highly pathogenic, even influenza, they have a page right now um, where you can go and um, it's on the front of their page. But if you uh, look up for avian influenza on their website, they have a lot of um, links that go to um, wild bird maps. Um, on there, that same agency that I just mentioned, um, Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative, and then OMAFRA um, has resources as well uh, for more specifically for, I would say, owners um, of flocks, small flocks, um, and, and larger flocks. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for data, I think it, it links um, from the CFIA. Um, and then the World Organization of Animal Health, they have um, some more aggregated um, data globally as well. I guess I'll wrap it up with one more question. <laughs> How do you personally feel about the current state of highly pathogenic avian influenza in Canada? Uh, personally, I think it has, it's, um, I would say it's comforting for those of us who have been working in it, uh, that it's, that it has slowed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I have to say just, you know, anecdotally watching the farmers who have been affected by it, I would have to give them all a, a big pat on the back because if you look at what they were, the disruptions they were experiencing in 2022 versus how they all reacted each time there was um, a new case in 2023, they're very quick um, and they're very um, resilient. Um, so personally, that makes me uh, feel pretty good about it seeing that you know they really do keep the food safety and the biosecurity top of mind um so realizing when you look uh, across the pond and to some migratory patterns that it could be here um for a while that really makes me feel better that you know I know what we're doing in the command center to try to keep everything prepared and um harmonized and then the farmers are really um on their toes with everything it seems like we're we're keeping it together uh, pretty well on both levels. So, um, all right, uh, I lied. I have one more question. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> um, when you talked about it was so the pillars were preparedness, prevention, and prevention was almost entirely biosecurity. Mm -hmm. Um, just like uh, a little biosecurity or a lot biosecurity. I'm wondering, has there ever been any talk of anything else that could happen, like? I mean, uh, in terms of avian influenza, it's likely to come from a wildlife reservoir. Has there ever been discussion of, I don't know, any any management of wildlife species? Or um, I, I don't know, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but yeah. any other kind of uh, preventative measures that could happen? Changes sure, yeah. to supply management? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, I would, I shouldn't say that, um, prevention, biosecurity is the only prevention. I think that's the first one that comes to mind. So when I'm giving um, in my presentation, the little snippets, that's the one that I would pick to focus on. Um, and especially as I'm presenting on um, the industry's uh, response and, and preparedness prevention, that is the one that we, we push and we, um, you know, that's really the top of mind. Mm -hmm. um, and if the industry, I believe, was to uh, focus on how we can try to to manage uh, wildlife and and the birds interactions with wildlife biosecurity is one of those ways um, because that's how we keep the birds that they're farming away uh, from um, the wildlife 
Um, but yeah, more broadly, I can see, I could see how that would um, be possible, but um, in industry, that's, I think that the biosecurity is what uh, we focus on and, and really value in this moment right now. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great answer. Um, I think that's it. I don't see any more questions and I may have exhausted all of mine for at least the, the time being. I want to thank you again, Maggie, for the great talk. It was really, uh, I think, an important topic. And I think you you went over the response really well. Um, I don't know if there's any other uh, finishing remarks. Francesco and Ellie, I see you're, you're back in person now. Uh, do you have anything to follow up with? Well, uh, thank you very much. This was really informative uh, for, for us, certainly. Uh, being in disaster and emergency management field, uh, this area has not been you know, looked at from at least uh, our point of view very, very well. Thank you for bringing it bringing that to our attention and hopefully uh, um, we, we try to work with you and uh, your, your team closely uh, if there is anything from research uh, uh, simulation modeling uh, that, that you mentioned uh, York is uh, creating great capacities in doing uh, disaster and emergency management research uh, Carly in particular is is uh, on board with by emerge and we would be really happy to to collaborate with you if there's anything we can we can do uh, so uh, thank you so much uh, and thank you Carly for for moderating this we, we do need you again and hope to have you again <laughs> it was my pleasure uh, I was so excited to see the the talk title thank you uh looking forward to that uh, uh Francesco you have any uh uh, no, I would just like to also echo my thanks to Dr. Rosens and to Maggie. The presentation was great, and thank you for for the discussion um, and for for all the follow up questions. Yeah, I think it went really well. Um, it was a very interesting topic, interesting talk. 